What's going on everybody? Greg Peters here, Miata Dad with the Car Passion Channel, and today I'm excited to install one of the most technologically advanced pieces of equipment yet into the Miata to see if there's any more horsepower I can squeeze out of that Borg Warner turbocharger, and I'll also be dispelling an internet myth, or possibly proving myself wrong. Either way, it's going to be a fun video. I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Let's go hit some boost. Today I'll be installing a turbo speed gauge into the Miata. It sounds like something out of Back to the Future, but it's actually a real thing and it's going to help me accomplish a couple tasks today. Number one, and most importantly, it's going to show me how efficiently that Borg Warner EFR6258 is operating while producing 420 wheel horsepower at 21 pounds of boost. You know, am I really efficiently using that turbo or am I pushing it past its limits? And the other thing that I can check is uh, I'll be proving or disproving an internet myth that I uh, kind of sparked a little discussion on when I posted a video over my other channel where I disconnected an intercooler pipe to see how much power and how fast the Miata was naturally aspirated. Now I didn't start this debate. This argument has existed on the internet for years and there are people that are both credible and knowledgeable on both sides of the argument and they both think they're 100% right. But today we're going to find out, can you overspin your turbo if you disconnect the intercooler pipe? Now I think you don't overspin the turbo, but I could be very wrong and we'll get into that later. The main focus today is about compressor efficiency. But to understand compressor efficiency, we got to take a little bit of a deep dive on how to read a compressor map. So here I've got a compressor map. <clears throat> Can I help you, Craig? It's not a compressor map. This is a compressor map. Thank you, Crocodile Dundee. So here I've got a compressor map. And what this does is shows the flow capabilities and the efficiency for a given compressor. Being able to read a compressor map is very important when it comes to choosing the right size turbocharger for your engine, but it doesn't tell the whole story. The compressor map only looks at the efficiency of the compressor. It doesn't take into account the size of the turbine or the AR or anything on that side of the turbo. For example, if you had two turbochargers that had the same compressor wheel but different turbines, those turbos would use the same compressor map, but they would act differently. So that's just something to think about as well. But today we're gonna to be focusing on just compressors because compressor efficiency is what we're gonna be measuring. Now what this map does show you is the maximum airflow or maximum horsepower that a compressor wheel can flow. And in most cases, the compressor wheel is the limiting factor on how much horsepower a turbo can produce. Now this is actually the map for the turbo that's on my car. So I can do an approximate plot of my car on this map, and then we can install that gauge and go out and do some real world testing. There is some confusion on how a turbo is limited to a certain amount of horsepower. Say a compressor is limited to 250 horsepower. It doesn't matter if you install that turbo on a 100 horsepower Miata engine or on a 200 horsepower Honda engine. The maximum that thing is gonna make is 250 horsepower. And that's where reading the compressor map really comes in because you plot out the different boost levels and power all together and combine that and see what the perfect size turbo is for your engine. So let's first look at the X axis on the compressor map. You'll see it's labeled in compressor flow or pounds per minute. Horsepower is all about airflow, not pressure or PSI. Let's go back to that example earlier of installing a 250 horsepower turbocharger. On the 100 horsepower Miata engine, it's probably gonna take 16 PSI of boost pressure to make 250 horsepower. On the 200 horsepower Honda engine, it's probably only gonna take six PSI to make that power. They're both gonna be making 250 horsepower at the end of the day. However, the airflow going through that turbocharger is the same in both cases. So that's why when people ask, well, how much PSI will it take to make this much power? It's not really a relevant question. It's how much airflow will it take to make that power? One pound of airflow will make approximately 10 horsepower at the crank. So just by looking at this map for my turbocharger, I can see the highest point right here is 
44 pounds. That's the maximum amount of air that the Borg Warner 6258 can flow. So 44 pounds of air equals 440 brake horsepower or crank horsepower, which translates to approximately 374 horsepower at the wheels. Uh, but hold on a second. The Miata made 420 wheel horsepower. How, how is that possible? It seems like it should be out of the limit of this turbocharger. Picture this scenario, two identical cars running 10 pounds of boost on the same turbo. One of them is on 91 octane, one of them is on E85. The car that's on E85 is gonna be able to get tuned with more ignition advance and it will be able to make more power at the same boost level. So that 10 horsepower per pound of airflow is not really a direct calculation all the time. It's really just an estimate, which is why I'm so interested to go out and get some real world testing to see how maxed out that turbocharger really is on my car. Now let's take a look at the Y axis on the graph, which is labeled pressure ratio. This is a simple formula of the air pressure coming into the turbo versus the air pressure coming out of the turbo, the compressor specifically. Let's look at a simple single turbo setup. The air that we all live in and breathe at sea level is about 14 and a half PSI. So that's the pressure of the air coming into the turbo. Now let's say you're driving along and you get on the throttle and your boost pressure on the gauge comes up to 14.5 PSI. The air that's coming into the turbo has now been boosted by 14.5 PSI, meaning the total is 29 PSI that's coming out of that compressor, double what it was coming in. That's a pressure ratio of two. Now the reason I say a simple single turbo setup is because pressure ratio really comes into effect when you're talking about twin turbo and compound boost setups where you have a supercharger feeding a turbocharger or a small turbocharger feeding a larger turbocharger. So let's say you have two turbos in sequence running a pressure ratio of two. You now have this atmospheric air that's 14 and a half PSI coming into the first turbo. It's coming out, pressure ratio of two means 14 and a half PSI of boost or 29 total PSI. And then into the next turbocharger with a pressure ratio of two, now that's 58 total PSI minus the atmospheric pressure of 14 and a half, which is 43 and a half pounds of boost. And the reason people use those compound turbo setups like that is because imagine trying to take one small turbo and getting it to produce 43 and a half pounds of boost. It's gonna have a lot harder time than that bigger turbo taking air that's already pressurized and then ramping it up more. A little bit of a tangent for this video, but I just want you to understand why they use pressure ratio and not you know PSI or pounds of boost on this axis. Because the compressor only cares about the ratio of the pressures on one side versus the other. Now let's check out this giant blob that's been plotted on this graph. At any given moment in time, at any boost pressure, when your engine is creating any level of horsepower, it exists as a dot somewhere on this map. If your engine is making 300 horsepower at the crank, that means it's flowing approximately 30 pounds per minute. Now let's say it's doing this at 14 and a half PSI, as discussed before, a pressure ratio of two. You take the two, you come across here, you take the 30 pounds per minute, you come across here, and you can see you land at a certain point in this plot. So obviously your engine could be operating at multiple different places on this map. And that's important because the first thing I wanna talk about here are these ovals. These ovals are known as efficiency islands. And you can see each oval has a number attached to it, 0.76. That means anywhere your dot lands inside this oval, the compressor is operating at 76% efficiency, and that is the best that this turbo can do. Now, your dot can't always be in that island, so you can see it might land anywhere in any of these other islands, all the way out to 60% is a much lower level of efficiency for this compressor. Compressor efficiency means how much that compressor can boost the air pressure without generating too much heat. The higher the efficiency, the more power the turbo can make without creating that extra heat. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you, I don't know the math that goes into calculating that 76% number, but if you guys wanna go even deeper on compressor maps, and I'm gonna go in this video, I have a link down below to a technical PDF released by Garrett. They go into a lot of the math, so if you wanna geek out like I do, 
check out that link in the description after you watch this video. Now any given turbocharger is going to produce more and more power going further and further right on this map until you hit the rightmost edge and that is known as the choke line. Beyond that you can spin the turbo faster and faster and pretty much all it's going to do is generate more heat. It might make more boost pressure but it's not going to make very much more power. And you'll see this is actually dictated by one of these bold black lines. These lines are known as the speed lines. And you can see on each end here, they have a number. It starts here at 50,000 RPM. No, that's not a typo. That is the lower edge of the map. And you can see up top, the choke line here is dictated by the compressor spinning at 168,000 RPM. Now, if my calculations are correct, uh, yeah, that's a tip speed. The tip speed is how fast the tips of the compressor blades are spinning. At peak, the EFR tip speed is over 1200 miles per hour, nearly double the speed of sound, or 1900 kilometers per hour. Now you could imagine a blade cutting through the air at 1200 miles per hour. It's going to have some crazy aerodynamic effects going on there, and that's where the compressor efficiency stuff gets real crazy. There's all kinds of physics and math that go into this chart, and beyond that, you might turn your turbo from 20 to 22 pounds of boost, and it doesn't make bare, it might make five more horsepower or something. And that's how you know you're beyond the limit of that compressor. If my calculations are correct, when this baby hits 88 miles an hour, you're gonna see some serious surge line is the next thing we're gonna talk about. Now I'm not referring to the little flutter sounds that your car makes when you delete your blow off valve. I'm talking about the worst kind of surge, the kind of surge that will blow your turbocharger apart surge under load, surge at full boost. That baby spools up and just starts going and you don't, you don't want your turbo to make those noises. Now for a given scenario, if your dot ends up up here somewhere, you are getting surge. Let's, let's look at an example. If you have a pressure ratio of three, but the engine is only producing 150 horsepower, that puts you above the surge line. So now all this pressure that's in your intercooler piping says, frick this, we're out of here, and tries to ram its way back through the compressor. That's where you get those really bad noises. That is surge under load, and where that usually happens is a car with a pretty small turbocharger that's able to create a lot of boost when the engine is not flowing that much air. Now, I think I've heard my turbo surge before, and I'm interested also to take it out and see how close I can get to that threshold. So why does any of that crazy information matter? I have some data that will help me get an approximate plot of my engine on this graph. I have a dyno, which tells me how much horsepower my car makes at any given RPM at full throttle. Of course, I can convert wheel horsepower to crank horsepower and then crank horsepower to pounds per minute. And I also have a data log from that dyno run that shows me the boost pressure, which I can then calculate the pressure ratio. So I made this little table and I'm gonna plot my engine real quick and see how it looks. And then I promise you, we are gonna install the flux capacitor on the Miata and see if I am pushing the limits of that turbocharger. We're, we're gonna do some serious boosted pulls in this video, okay? Hang with me. Have you learned? I know it's, someone's learned something. If you learned something already, smash that like button. That's right where it starts, full throttle, 2500 RPM. I'm right here on the map. Obviously, turbo is not performing at its peak efficiency at 2500 RPM, nor do I want it to be, because how often do I need full power and max efficiency there? Okay, so this represents the path of efficiency that the compressor takes as it spools up at full throttle from 2500 RPM all the way up. Now you can see it's in this peak efficiency island from here to here. What does that represent? 28 pounds or 280 horsepower up to uh, about 33 pounds or 330 horsepower. 3,800 to 4,200 RPM. That turbo is peak efficiency. Now obviously that's a pretty narrow window, but it's still in the very good efficiency islands, you know, in this whole range right here, which is 
it is the mid-range. It's 3,500 to 5,000 RPM. That's where the meat of the power band is. But what's awfully suspicious is this right here represents 420 wheel horsepower at 21 PSI. And if I just map my turbo going on these estimates, I'm way outside of the compressor efficiency map. Now, like I said earlier in the video, this estimate right here is gonna be affected by the fuel type and the tuning and several other factors. So the main thing I wanna find out by installing this turbo speed gauge is am I spinning the compressor faster than 168,000 RPM? That's this line right here. So if I were to take my car out and do a full throttle run all the way to red line, full boost, and this gauge reads 157,000 RPM, that means I can spin my turbocharger another 10,000 RPM faster, aka I can turn the boost up, and it should make more power. Now if that gauge reads 168,000 RPM, that means I'm operating right on the limit of the turbo and it really just doesn't have any more power left. So that's going to be real interesting. Now obviously I'm not going to be able to just like watch this gauge while I'm driving and correlate the RPM and do all the calculations and everything. So I will also be hooking this up to the Mega Squirt, which will be able to data log the turbo speed. This is all just a really cool system. I'm stoked to get it installed. So I'm gonna grab my soldering iron, we're gonna do some wiring, and um, let's get this thing put in the Miata. All right, so now that you know probably more than you ever wanted to about compressor maps, let's take a brief look at how a turbo speed gauge works. The Borg Warner turbos have a port in the compressor housing, which can be drilled through, and then you can put this this sensor into it and what this sensor does is it sits right up next to the blades of the compressor wheel and it gives off a signal every time one of those blades passes by the tip of the sensor. You can see the front of the compressor wheel there. If you look through the port that the sensor came out of, you can see where the compressor wheel blades pass right by there and that's what the sensor is measuring. Now the wheel I've got here is very similar to what's inside the Borg Warner Turbo. This is actually a billet wheel for a Garrett GT2560R. This is what's called a 6x6 design. So it's got six long primary blades and six short blades, but a total of 12 blades. Now the compressor that's inside the Borg Warner is a 7x7 design, so it's got a total of 14 blades. Now you remember the peak compressor speed on this turbo is 168,000 RPM. You have to multiply that 168,000 RPM times 14 blades, and that sensor can measure 2.3 million blade passes per minute. That's almost 40,000 blade passes per second. You can see why you need a special piece of equipment to measure that type of metric. All right, so on to the installation here. This gauge on the outside is pretty simple. It's got the little backing piece where you stick it through a 52 millimeter or a two inch hole. Then you put the backing piece on and you thread on the little gold nuts and that will hold the gauge itself in place. So the left blade is a ground for the gauge. The right blade is 12 volt power for the gauge, which makes it light up and also provides power to the sensor. And then the center blade is actually optional. It's called analog out. And that is the wire that you would hook up to a standalone ECU. And you can data log the compressor speed from this gauge. And I will be showing you guys how to hook that up to Mega Squirt as well. And the sensor cable is also included with the gauge. And the wires there are just power to the gauge. The black is for the gauge to ground. And then the white is for the signal that comes from the sensor into the gauge and the purple and gray are for things that we're not using overspeed warning light and pressure sensor because the gauge itself can actually read pressure but we don't need to do that because the mega squirt can read the pressure and I'll be doing all the data logging through mega squirt not really using the gauge. Now I don't really know where I'm going to mount this thing yet. I'm probably just going to mount it inside the glove box and it won't be permanently visible. With my tablet set up I can have that read out the compressor speed. Yes it is possible to have some kind of conversion box just read that sensor and do all this instead of getting the gauge. One thing that having the gauge helped with is ensuring that I'm getting an accurate signal because if I was just using a conversion box, I, I don't really know how to uh, make that an accurate readout. Now I can compare the gauge to what the mega squirt is reading and actually make sure I have an accurate calibration. The wires hanging in the glove box there with the blade connectors are just a switch 12 volt power that I use to power all my gauges, my cutout, my tablet, and then a simple ground wire. So I'm gonna hook those up, switch the ignition on, and we'll see if the gauge works. Boohees, look at that, the little full race display. All right, now I'm just gonna get the sensor put back into the compressor housing, hook that sensor up to the gauge so it can actually get a reading, and nothing. So either the sensor, maybe the sensor's 
burned out or something or something's hooked up wrong. I have no idea. Maybe I have to configure it. It actually has presets for all the different EFR turbos, and then it's got other generic presets. If you have this system installed in a turbo that's not EFR, you can just select how many blades your compressor has, and then it will output the right information on the gauge. And it still seems to not work. It just reads three lines of turbo RPM. I wasn't really sure what was going on at this point, but I figured it out, boys. Their RPM was just too low to register. Watch this. That was 24,000 RPM. Oh my God, that is freaking sick. All right, it's time to get this thing hooked up to the ECU and then we'll go play. Analog input is what we're gonna use on the options port to hook any sensor that has an analog output up to Megasquirt. I'm gonna use the C that's analog input two and you can see here's a diagram of the options plug. So I just have to remember which pin that is and then I'll go ahead and pin the gauge into the Megasquirt. Unplug the options port and then we just gotta pop this thing open. We'll get that bad boy soldered up and hooked up and then see if we can't get it configured inside of Tuner Studio and see if we can get this whole system working. Being able to data log information from a sensor is so important and so useful compared to just installing a gauge. I mean, gauges are good for things that you can kind of roughly spot check while you're driving, you know, AFR and boost and stuff like that, but you're not gonna be watching your compressor turbo speed gauge and actually be able to retain any data from it. But if you can data log it through an ECU, you can overlay that information with any other metric that the ECU measures and you can just learn a lot more from it. If you go to advanced engine and just go to generic sensor inputs, you can set up any additional sensors that you've plugged into the Megasquare. You can see you've got slots for a ton of different sensors. So the source is gonna be analog in two and you can name it. This is how it's going to appear in the data logs. I just know that the signal from this sensor is linear and that's another reason I wanted to have the gauge as well so I can compare gauge readings to tuner studio and make sure that I'm actually getting accurate numbers because I could configure this thing to give me inaccurate numbers and then it's sort of pointless to have it in there. So this here is where you calibrate the sensor and you have to input your own values. And I couldn't find anything on the internet as far as what values this sensor needed because the signal that the sensor puts out is in Hertz and then the gauge converts that into a voltage for the ECU to read. Looked everywhere, could not find it, could not figure out an accurate way to do it. So what I ended up doing was just driving around and punching values in here. And I just did that until Tuner Studio read the same numbers as the gauge. All right, so now that I have the gauge all hooked up and working, I can finally take the car out and film some pulls. Turbo gets to like 70,000 RPM just cruising through side streets, not even getting into boost. Just doing a quick comparison between my pull on the dyno versus a high gear pull out on the road. You can see at 3,500 RPM on the dyno, under 16 pounds. Out on the road, 20 PSI at the same RPM. That's where you can get compressor surge out in the uh, real world that you might not see on the dyno. All right, now that I've been able to collect a bunch of real world data using my newly installed equipment, as the great Philip DeFranco would say, We've got a lot to unpack here, and I want to start with the surge line. Now, you guys remember earlier in the video, I plotted this blue line here, and that is an estimate of where my setup should sit on this compressor map based on the fact that, on average, a turbo will produce approximately 10 horsepower at the crank per pound per minute that it can flow. Now, from my testing, I've actually discovered that on my specific setup, that number is closer to just over 11 horsepower at the crank 
per pound. Now I'll get to how I calculated that in just a second, but for now, what that's gonna let me do is get a more accurate plot on this compressor map of where my engine sits. Okay, so you can see now a little bit closer to the surge line, but still not even close to it. So I'm not really worried, right? Uh, maybe. Let me bring up one more point. As you can see on the screen right now, I did a spool test in third, fourth, and fifth gear. The three different colors you can see are how the turbo spools based on how much load there is. What if I took the maximum boost the engine could generate under the highest load at 3,500 RPM compared to what it could make on the dyno? Now on the dyno, it's just over 15 pounds of boost. But out on the street, I was able to make over 20 PSI. So you can see the difference here is pretty big when the load is much higher, but we're still plenty safe from that surge line. So one small detail that I forgot to mention here is in order to get the most accurate plot on the compressor map, you should be reading the pressure at the turbo, not at the engine. The ECU reads the pressure at the engine or at the intake manifold because that's what matters for tuning. But when you're talking about the compressor efficiency, it doesn't care how much pressure is going into the engine, only how much pressure is in the turbocharger itself. And the reason there's a difference is because all intercoolers have what's called a pressure drop. And it's usually only one to two PSI, but the turbo could be generating 23 PSI, but only 21 PSI is making it into the engine. When it comes to compressor efficiency, all you care about is the pressure that's coming out of that compressor. So that is gonna shift the plot around a little bit. It's not gonna make that much of a difference unless you have a huge pressure drop, but I just wanted to mention it. And there is a way to measure your pressure drop to see if you need to change your intercooler, and that is running a map sensor or a pressure sensor before the intercooler, and then the ECU has already got one measuring the pressure after the intercooler, and then you can see, Oh, the turbo is generating 24 PSI, but only 20 PSI is making it into the engine. That means you have a four PSI pressure drop, and that is too high. Your pressure drop should only be one to two at the most. Now, I really wish I had dual map sensors so I could share that information with you guys during this test as well, but I don't. Well, I didn't, but now I do, or I will. So maybe possible future testing, future video. Anyways, let's get back to the show. However, the engine is just not as efficient at that lower RPM, so even if you make crazy amounts of boost, there's just not that much more power to be had. And if you scour the internet looking for dynographs of turbo or even supercharged Miatas, you're gonna have trouble finding anything that can put down what my car can below 4,000. And that's not a brag, it's more of like, I'm trying to spread the knowledge. My car makes 250 foot-pounds of torque at the wheels at 3,400 RPM, and 300 foot-pounds of torque at 3,700 RPM. You may be able to match or maybe beat that by a little bit with a much smaller turbo, but you are not gonna be generating 400 wheel horsepower with that turbo. Because as you can see with the dyno that's on screen, my car makes it 300 foot-pounds at 3,700, but it's able to carry above 300 foot-pounds all the way to 7,100, which is what makes the power band on that car so usable and I just, every time I drive it, I just, it's just so enjoyable to me. It's such a great street car with that super wide torque band and fast spooling turbo. Let's move over to the fun side of the map. I'm talking about 168,000 RPM of spoolie goodness. That would be the choke limit. So the first thing I wanna do here is bring up a data log from one of my juiciest polls. And you can see here that the compressor is spinning up to 159,000 RPM. 159,000. So you're telling me that I could spin that turbo 9,000 RPM faster? You're telling me there's more power to be had? Not exactly. Let me go ahead and overlay the boost data here. And as you can see, I was only making 19 and a half pounds of boost. And that was the most I was able to get out of it, despite even turning up the electronic boost control to 100% duty cycle. Now there's a few different reasons this could have been happening. Number one, the sensor might be reading a little bit low and the compressor is just not able to spin any faster because of the aerodynamic disturbance that it hits once it reaches its peak speed. Number two, the volumetric efficiency of the engine at that very high RPM is falling very fast and there might just not be enough energy in the exhaust 
to spin the turbo fast enough to generate any more airflow. And the third possibility is the wastegate spring might be getting overwhelmed by the exhaust gases. Now in my car right now, I have a 10 PSI wastegate spring. And the general rule of thumb is you can run about double the boost pressure of your wastegate spring and expect pretty accurate boost control. But it's called rule of thumb for a reason in that it's not always the case. And it's possible that the 10 pound spring just can't hold the wastegate closed in that high RPM, so it's not able to hold the boost. So I did what any normal person would do. I busted out my collection of TurboSmart wastegate springs. If this thing doesn't want to make boost, then by golly, I'm gonna force it to make boost. So you just have to open up the IWG75 and right here I've got a collection of extra springs all color coded for different pressures and these can be stacked up to three springs i'm going to use my turbo smart chart here put the right amount of springs in here and i'm going to bump that base pressure from 10 psi up to 17 psi thread this thing back together bolt it onto the car with a couple 10 millimeters and gaining horsepower is just that easy Okay, I'm sorry I keep interrupting the video. Last time, I promise. This is one of those random things that I just thought was really cool. If you listen to these pulls, I have the mic on the turbo. So between gears, you cannot hear the diverter valve open at all because I'm using flat shift and it's a perfect audible demonstration of how that boost just is maintained in the system. And as soon as you get back in the next gear, it's all there and ready to go. And then at the end of the pull, you can hear what it sounds like when the diverter valve opens when I actually lift off the throttle. Now I have the information I'm looking for. So if I bring up a data log of an even juicier pull, we can see right over here at 6,700 RPM, where the engine does generate its peak horsepower, we're making just over 21 PSI, and the compressor speed shows right about 170,000. Now that's a slight discrepancy from what the gauge reads at its peak. But you can see 168,000 RPM is the physical limit of what that thing can spin. So what I've done here is scientifically proven that the turbo is maxed out. And that's also how I figured out on my specific setup, how much horsepower it generates per pound per minute flowed. At the compressor's limit, it is flowing 44 pounds per minute. The car made 420 wheel horsepower on the dyno, so it makes roughly nine and a half horsepower at the wheels per pound per minute float. Hey Craig, man, won't you man up? My boys on the same turbo running 25 PSI, you only running 21. What's going on? All that really tells me about your boy's setup is he has a more restrictive system than I do, and that turbo has to push at 25 PSI to flow the same amount of air, because I can guarantee that car at 25 PSI does not make any more horsepower. In fact, it probably makes less because that turbo is generating more heat at a higher boost level. Because if you have a more restrictive intake manifold, throttle body, uh, ports in the head, exhaust manifold, the turbo has to push harder to get the same amount of air to flow through those parts. And that really makes the question, how much PSI can my engine handle? Kind of irrelevant. PSI is just a measure of restriction. It's airflow that equates to horsepower. All right, on to the next. <clears throat> yes, Craig, didn't you just roast your own license plate? They ask you how you are, and you just have to say that you're fine when you're not really fine, but you just can't. Aren't you wearing the same shirt as yesterday? Go make your own videos. Okay, okay. If you can only run 21 PSI, why were you at 24 PSI in that data log? Oh, guys, well, looks like I'm exposed for turning my boost down for safety. Psych. See, that's in the mid-range. And when you're down in the mid-range, the engine is making less horsepower, okay? So instead of being here, the mid-range is actually down here, so you can safely generate more boost here. I might be able to run 30 PSI in the mid-range. I might be able to run 30 PSI in the mid-range. Possible future video.
So that's about all I can tell you about compressor maps and efficiency and all that stuff. But there's one more order of business. See, I posted a video on my second channel where I was just messing around, disconnected the turbo to see how slow the car would be without boost, how much power it wouldn't make. And I got some Fs in the chat for my turbocharger. People saying, you're gonna overspin your turbo to the moon and you're gonna blow it apart. But um, there's no real data on that that I could find online. But now that I have the tools to measure it, let me see if I can go out and ruin my turbo. Okay, now that we got all the performance stuff out of the way, return the Miata to NA. Wastegate is propped open and we're gonna see if running a disconnected intercooler pipe will overspin the turbo. This one is for my boy, 18 PSI. Actually, it's really just for the greater good, so you guys don't end up overspinning your turbos. I'll put mine at risk for you. We'll see how fast we can get this thing to spin, and uh, yeah, let's go do some pulls. And just in case the turbo doesn't overspin, I brought my 10 mil so I can close up that wastegate and see just how fast we can get this thing to zip or possibly give myself second degree burns. That was a run to 7,600 RPM about, and the turbo did reach just over 100,000 RPM, which is well within the safe range, but now I'm really curious what's gonna happen if I close the wastegate. So I'm gonna get that thing closed and see how much faster it spins. <sighs> okay, and I just did those pulls. I cannot believe how hot that is. I only burned myself once. Let's take this thing out and see how fast it spins. Science. Let's see what the data log shows on the closed wastegate pull. Again, 7,600 RPM and 128,000 RPM on the compressor speed. So it turns out that in fact, even with the wastegate closed, the turbo is not even close to overspinning. In fact, it could spin another 40,000 RPM faster and it still wouldn't be overspinning. I'm not saying that every engine and turbo combination will be like this. Maybe it's possible to overspin your turbo, but if your concern is, I wanna leave the turbo disconnected to break in the engine, to drive the car to the tuners, particularly if you're not going to the rev limiter at full throttle, you're definitely not gonna overspin the turbo, so I would not worry about it. All right guys, I had a ton of fun making this video. If you enjoyed it, if you learned something, don't forget to smash that like button. Subscribe if you are new. And if you like this longer, more technical video, let me know down in the comments below and I'll try to do more of them. But until next time, peace out, keep on boosting.